Well, hello. Welcome to the all-new Classics World podcast. I'm Joe Miller. I'm Phil Whedon. I'm Jack Grover. And every month or so, we're going to be talking through the news in the classic car world. We're going to be debating a hot topic, looking back at some of our favourites from the best manufacturers in classic car history and perusing the classifiers and trying not to buy a couple of tempting beauties. But first, chaps, what have we been up to in the last four or five weeks or so, 2023? What have we been doing, Jack? Uh... I have not been up to much in the world of my own cars because uh, it's the middle of winter, they're all safely tucked away and they're generally dependable enough that I don't have to spend every week fixing them. But what I have generally been doing is turning my attention to one of the Classic World's project vehicles, which has been on the channel a couple of times, which is the Land Rover, the 1971 Series 2A. Charming thing, but it has been a bit of a Problem challenge. As a, as a vehicle, it has been great. As a project, it has been difficult <laughs> um, and not through any, not really through any fault of its own either it's been a logistical problem and interesting sort of relearning experience because I got my start in old cars and Land Rovers. Land Rovers were my first automotive love which is why Phil was so easily able to convince me to take this on and then it only took one day sitting in, it, in the bottom of the motor and going no fine I can handle this but yeah when I was 17 and had a grotty series 3 Land Rover and Every other sort of third person in Hampshire also had a Grotti Series 3 Land Rover. There was a, someone who could fix one in every single village, and every garage, even if they weren't a Land Rover specialist, would work on one. Sometimes you might get a bit of teeth sucking, and you'd say, oh, I have to get the old boy in for that at the weekend. But they were happy to work on it, and you could just get bits over the counter. You could probably go to, you could still go to Halfords and buy bits for Series Land Rovers. Not anymore. Not anymore. So when I have been searching around Peterborough and the east, an increasingly wide part of the East Midlands, <laughs> trying to find someone to work on a long wheelbase Series 2A Land Rover. Um, it has been surprisingly difficult, because I thought it would be easy. Um, and I think in a trend that is across not just garages, but all sorts of crafts and trades and businesses in general at the moment, they're either absolutely rammed solid with work and can't yeah. take it on for the foreseeable future, or they don't want to work on it because it's too old. So what I've been doing the past few weeks is we ended up coming to an arrangement where the editor of Classics Monthly, Simon Goldsworthy, has a barn and we were able to shove the Land Rover in there so it's undercover, there's somewhere with tools and space to work because otherwise I'd be doing it on the street with a cheapy Halfords tool set and I took the engine apart myself, uh, which was interesting, both I enjoyed it, it was good getting spanners on a Land Rover again. Did you find a bent con rod? It, Pushrod. Pushrod, sorry. Push, no, no, you're not. Ben, ben Conrod. Conrod. Yeah, yeah. Conrod would be... Yeah. Engine. Yeah. That sounds like a comic character. Ben, ben Con Conrod. <laughs> no, Ben Conrod would be a big, a, a big yes. concern. And I'd also want... I'd love to know what can bend a Land Rover petrol engine Conrod. But yeah, yeah a pushrod, which is interesting because it drove so well and ran so beautifully. It seemed to run well. And yet it had a bent pushrod uh, for reasons as yet undetermined, but the cylinder head is actually in the boot of my Citroen Xanti, which is currently out in the car park. And, we, and, and we've gone from being like three months ahead of the game with this project yes. to now being pretty much, we've got to do this now, otherwise it will miss the, the print that was, that was the thing, that was why it became a bit of all hands on deck. Ten times, but as ever, it always works. On the subject of broken cars, Phil? <laughs> uh, yes, I had a rough week actually, and again, not really sort of anything, you know, uh, premeditated, but I had a tyre blowout on the way home last week due to the dreadful state of the roads at the moment, lots and lots of potholes and I was approaching a motorway services and there was a badly visible pothole which I sunk into and destroyed a brand new tyre. And was that a nice cheapy ditch finder on a banger? No, it was a brand new Bridgestone, so on my Audi TT, so that's frustrating. Um, and then of course, you break out the sort of space aid which probably hasn't seen the light of day in 20 years um, because I don't think it's ever been on the car before. So then you're sort of wondering whether all this is going to work. But um, on my recently acquired BMW E36 convertible that's also appeared on the channel through our Trading Up series that happened last year, mm. um, I was defrosting the car and uh, was wiping down the uh, passenger window and accidentally lent on the drive, uh, driver's electric window, which then proceeded to try and drop while the window was still frozen in the seal uh, and of course the rails come away from the glass 
uh, and now I need a new window rail and regulator, which is really annoying because that was... <laughs> that car's pretty much perfect. <laughs> perfect, until basically I ruined it. But um, it doesn't matter. The car will be back on the road by Friday and uh, it's Wednesday. And that, and that can stick on the fleet and obviously still use that. Yes, exactly. Speaking of the fleet, I've been responsible for thinning it down a little the bit. Defleeting. Yes, indeed. Um, I've been um, on the uh, classifieds and on the old Ebays uh, listing various of our project cars for sale. Been a disposal auction. Yes, it, indeed. Joe Quality Cars with two Ks. Um, and the headline in that is our Bentley Turbo R. It has finally gone. The so mighty how many times did we try and sell that? Five, five times people won the auction and then never got in touch and never paid a penny for it. Five, five times. times. However, you will like that eventually the buyer who did actually turn up and collect the car, he paid for it within 24 hours, he messaged me within half an hour of the auction finishing and he has other car is a Jaguar XJ12 Series 3. So we man of like man a stand-up fellow. Man yes. of taste and integrity. If you are listening and you bid on an eBay item, particularly a high-value item like a car, just pay for it and collect it, please. Is the Bentley, was the Bentley Turbo a high-value item by the end oh, of it? Uh, Do you know what? Com compared, to the, compared to the other car I sold, That's which was the it. Rover 75, oh. which is also gone. You won't have seen yet. There's an update video coming on that. That car has caused me a lot of grief. But that has gone for a fair price to a good home. The chap's had four Rover 75s. He's got one with 300,000 miles on it, so he loves them. He's going to make it good again. And it has freed up space on my driveway for my new car, which... I won't spoil that surprise, but... We'll reveal that later. My you month has been defleeting. It's great that the Bentley and the Rover have gone off to the appropriate home. It sounds like the guy that's got the Bentley understands what he's getting himself into, <laughs> which is, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a big car that's cheap for what he's paid for it, but it's obviously going to need a lot of TLC afterwards. And does 18 to the gallon on a good day. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, he's buying it, hopefully, with his eyes open. And the same with the Rover 75, a fairly low-value modern classic, but actually, with someone who's willing to yeah. give a bit of uh, nurture to it, it'll be a great car. It needs a bit of love, that car, but I think this is the right chap to get it. And... 75 generally reward effort put into them as well because they, you know, they, they can as you know he's got one of 300,000 miles on but I've, I know a few people with 75s which are now got well over 200,000 yeah, and far from unheard of and, and it's yeah. a lovely community I will say anyone in the 75 community that I've had anything to do with I had to buy a new carpet for it little spoiler for the video um, and the chap who I bought it off gave me a great price for it he said if you need any other parts let me know he even chucked in some free trim clips to put bits of broken trim back together lovely people really helpful so it's interesting as a modern classic it seems to have had quite wide acceptance mm. in the community really so strong following. whether it's just because it's a it's a really decently engineered car and it's i think it's a, a good really car. good car yeah. isn't it so um there you go yeah. if, if you fancy a modern classic you can use every day and you've only got space for one car a 75 will tick all your boxes and if you want something sporty an mgzt yeah, so version, yeah. i i agree but moving on that was the past that has gone let's talk about the present jack over to our news correspondent. What's happened? We've got the latest I've, editions of the Classic Car Buyer here. I've now just, just been promoted to news correspondent of Classics World. In a matter of the last <laughs> 10 seconds. <laughs> uh, fortunately, I'm not going to be completely blind because I do actually work on the newspaper as my day job. So I should be across the news, and I am. In a roughly chronological order, chronological order going through the last few issues of the paper, these are the stories that caught my eye that I thought we might be wanting to chat about. So across 2023 in general, this is Lotus's 75th anniversary year. Oh, gosh, another big anniversary. It's a, quite a good lot of anniversaries this year, but this is the one that, yeah, and obviously I think Lotus going through a period of change at the moment, but it yes. is, yes. yes, change for the better commercially, certainly. Um, obviously, whether a lot of the Lotus enthusiasts will agree, still yet to be Do seen. They? I don't know, that's a good it's, question. They're I don't divided. Know. Yeah, are they? I think it all depends what sort of car they're considering as well. Because well, very true. The, the Amira seems to be very, very popular. Yeah. All the journalists, look, I, I think it's a stunning looking thing. Mm -hmm. But I have to say, and I, I mean, you know, you firmly know my opinion on SUVs. Um, but when they revealed an SUV with a Lotus badge on it, I, um, I, I was a little bit sick. I won't yeah, lie. Yeah. Can we move swiftly on from Lotus before I get violent? Okay, I so think so. Yeah, Lotus seventy fifth. <laughs> Lotus has had its ups and downs, and it has had various. Images of itself. We'll get the camps that, that will just revere Colin Chapman yes. forever and ever, and there'll be loads of people that. Well, also to... slightly overlooking the fact that he actually, his philosophy sort of drove it into the ground almost in the 70s. Yeah, and Not then sure. of course there'll be Not loads, of, <laughs> loads <laughs> of trouble, usually serious type yes. inequities and things like that. So, you know. The fact is that in this day and age, you can't just make an Elise. It's not no. possible to make an Elise anymore, so they have to, they have to reinvent themselves. There has, and to, be a, there has it, to be a, a, a mass market product. To, it, in the same way, when we visited Bentley, like Bentley can't exist as a six and three quarter litre V8 
gas guzzling monstrosity these days. It's just not viable. They have to reinvent themselves as low emission, sustainable, and that's what they're doing. And Lotus are moving in a new direction. And if that means electric hypercars and it means SUVs that they're still around, they've got a better future than Jaguar, dare I say it. Well, yeah. <laughs> got quite a lot of coverage in lots of the media when it happened, but I think we should probably mention the sad passing away of Tom Caron at the tail end of last year. Yeah. Um, a man who had a hand in designing a lot of much loved classics and I think as a lot of the obituaries at the time basically summed it up he's the man who designed the 70s as far as a lot of Britain's yeah. concerned certainly he designed the good bits of the 1970s yeah I think that's the th that's one of the interesting things is that so many of his designs are pretty much the only bits of 70s design iconography that actually people have looked back on and gone actually that's Really Fondly, cool. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. There's lots of lots of stuff coming out of the '70s that people are very glad to see the back of, and a lot of the stuff that people aren't glad to see the back of is his. Is his? Yes. Is he sort of a bit of a, a, a lower profile sort of engineering icon from that era? Because you know you get sort of overshadowed by the sort of the spend yeah. kins of this world and all that kind of stuff, you know. And actually, it, I like that he's still lived and breathed the his his legacy without mm -hmm. being egotistical about it right to the end. And yeah. you know, he would still attend Bond Bug club meets and sign people's cars and things like yeah, that. Yeah, and I, I think the Bond Bug is phenomenal. We need to do a video on one of those. But it, yeah, I, I a lot of respect for the boat. So rest in peace. Condolences to his family and friends and communities that he left behind. Yes, no, I think that's a, a good a good summary. Um, and this is a new story, which um, I think we should probably devote, devote a proper chapter to at some point. But as a headline, one in three breakdowns are being missed by the smart systems on smart motorways. Ooh. So that generates a lot yeah, of reader of, correspondence this is in one the of paper, the, doesn't it? It does. I say this is since I see all the emails coming in. I think this is probably the one that has the steadiest flow. Yeah. of Opinions. read response and it's universally negative yes, <laughs> amongst I, the CCB yeah, readers, which I have a lot of sympathy with. Mm. Yeah. Um, well, a lot of people had a lot of central reservations about this idea and um, they, they haven't got a hard first, shoulder to first cry First pun on. of the podcast. Um, Are we going to get a pun counter? Have we got a bunch yeah. of yeah, pun Yes, so I was going to say bottom corner, <laughs> ding, ding. <laughs> um, in all seriousness, right, with smart motorways, yeah. what I don't understand is that A, they seem to sort of still require a huge amount of work to yeah. make them happen anyway, which well, you is like, all they ever, couldn't you just made an extra lane? Yeah. Um, the, the second point is that if it is all about trying to maximise traffic through a fixed footprint because they don't want to make the roads any wider, I would refer evidence to the M42 uh, on the outskirts of Birmingham, which was probably one of the first smart mm -hmm. motorways, where actually, for the majority of the time, the hard shoulder is still a hard shoulder. Yeah. And they only turn the hard shoulder into an active lane in heavy traffic, at which point the speed is reduced to 40 miles an hour, so right, therefore yeah. the risks are presumably yes. controlled. And because if it's if it's only a, a full blown, full width smart motorway for two to three hours a day, and of those three hours, the traffic is generally trickling along at 40 miles an hour, the risks are surely lower. Mm -hmm. The scary thing is because we do the journey from Yording, you could be driving along the M25 on that inside lane, which was once the hard shoulder, at 70 miles an hour in the pitch black, and there's a car in yeah. that lane without you realising. Yeah, no warning. And it doesn't even need to be full width at that point because at eight o'clock in the evening you could easily run that motorway on two or three lanes without mm -hmm. needing the, the other one open. I agree that I think the part-time sort of sometimes smart sometimes not like you say with the M42 I think that is the right way to do it and I, I do sometimes object to the way they run in some ways with the signage so a good example I was driving up to um, Newcastle for our friends WB and Sons uh, a while back and um, I found myself there was reduced speed limit signs you know they dropped them down to 50 or 60 or whatever like, okay accident whatever slowed it down and you come to a sign that says speed limit reduced to ease pollution now, I'll leave this to you as the audience. If you were driving through that in a Tesla or a Nissan Leaf or our, our director Steve's Porsche Taycan, are you then still allowed to do 70? Because regardless of how fast you're going, there is nothing more coming out of the tailpipe because you don't have one. Noise yeah. pollution from your tyres on your <laughs> heavy electric car. Does it make that much difference though? Comments I, below? Well, certainly not, but there we go. I just thought I had to, I'll throw a devil's advocate. The, the, yeah. other, the other point about smart motorways, because there is a lot of hysteria about them and how sort of mm -hmm. stupid and dangerous they are. I mean, there are plenty of dual carriageways that are just two lanes and don't even have a hard shoulder. Yeah. So it's not as if smart motorways are this brand new sort no. of ridiculous idea. I mean, I do think every sort of busy arterial road like that should have some sort of hard shoulder. Yeah. But, you know, I do think the whole thing needs to have a, have a, a rethink. Haven't they paused any They've, more rollout yeah, of smart yes. motorways? Okay. It sounds sensible. It, put it this way, I've never once heard anyone say, I really like smart motorways, yeah. I think they're an excellent idea. If you do, again, get in touch. Anyway, next up in the news, Jack. Um, so this is a little story, which again, I think is just highlights a trend that's been going for a while, but um, Everati, 
The EV converters have added electric Range Rover Classic and Land Rover Defenders to their range that you can get EV, converter, EV conversions on. So this is yet another, I mean, they've been... You're um, choosing all the controversial topics, aren't you, about mm. electrifying... Devices from day one, that's this podcast. This electric versions of both the Defender and the Range Rover Classic have existed already. One of the big names in the business has added that to their, their range. So the trend is growing. Is, a, is, is an electric Range Rover Classic a diminished Range Rover Classic? Does it have to have the Rover V8 in it? I mean, I drive an electric car as my daily modern car, but mm. I, I, I don't really like the notion of an electrified Classic, no, I personally don't, speaking. I, I, I don't either. I think it entirely depends on context. I agree with the Range Rover because I think the, the V8, the vibrations, the noise, that's part of it. And it's a Range Rover. It's going to make some noise from panel caps, if nothing else. Um, but there are certain cars, and we've had this discussion off camera, and again, the prime candidate for this, and people will jump in the comments, is the Citroen DS. Yeah. Because the only part well, of that car that is, exactly, it, even in 2.3 guys, it's at best it's dull and at worst it's weedy. Why not complete that car with an electrification or a silver shadow, something like that? It, so it can work, but I don't think with something like the Range Rover where the engine is such a, it's the beating heart of the beast, it's, it's part of it, I don't think you can replace yeah. that. Yeah, that's probably fair, isn't is it? That, I think generally I more agree with Phil. I, I have absolutely no problem with EVs. I, if the situation was right and I could afford one, I would happily run an EV as a you know, modern EV as my ordinary car. Um, as someone who doesn't drive much and therefore their classic, my classics are my hobby cars, mm. I drive them big for the experience. Yes, I agree. And I think, thinking of my car specifically, I think my Citroen 2 CV would be much worse as an I EV. Think, I, I think, I think and though that's one of those cars where the, the, the character thing comes a lot from the engine, f flaws and all. An electric 2CV is better than not having a 2CV, but I think it would be an inferior one. I agree, because the whole point of that car is the noise and the vibrations exactly. and everything I else. I guess I'm just holding out hope that there will be a way past the 2030 ice band that sees sustainable fuels. I think really synthetic it's fuels it's and stuff will... Thing is yeah. that, and I know there's people saying that the cost of sustainable fuels uh, is, is quite high, but presumably if, if demand was there, it would be... It, it's supply and demand, exactly. But and I think it is, there's, there's more of a headline for it. My Mazda just completed however many thousand miles, I, I'll put it up on screen now, um, in an MX-5, fueled entirely by sustainable fuel. Thousands of, and I think, so it's, it's proof that the big companies are listening to it and they're working with it. Doesn't Sebastian Vettel, the Formula One driver, drive an old Williams Formula One car from the 90s, like a Nigel Mansell car, on completely on. biofuel mm -hmm. around Silverstone yep. or something to prove the point that the technology exists. I think it's phenomenal, and we, we were, we're at the turning point of things like this. I think, I think, I think all these different um, fuels and power sources have their niches, because EV is nowhere, you know, ele battery electric is nowhere near suitable for, say, good uh, commercial vehicles, you know, yep. no. HGVs. Diesel engine has ruled that market for 60 years, because if you want to efficiently, reliably put out huge amounts of power for long periods of time, diesel's brilliant, and EV can't do that, but hydrogen can. Yes. Yeah, that's mm. a, you, I think, because JCB are working really hard on synthetic fuel, and I think they're also working on hydrogen, because again, yes. you can't, having a, having a plug-in JCB excavator just doesn't... Well, did, I've got visions of a digger lifting yeah. it, and as it loses charge, it's lifting it yeah. slower yeah. and slower. Did JCB do some real live tests with a, with a digger, to basically simulating a sort of a day's work yeah. using a battery pack. I think pack. they did, And yes. I think they worked out that the battery pack would need to be four tonnes. Yeah. yeah. And that, and just to power a day's worth of... So, so that sounds entirely plausible. Yeah. So it's roughly two, one and a bit Bentley Turbo R's worth of battery right there. Yeah. <laughs> Which you'd need to sell ten times. Well, exactly. That, there's, a, there's a lot of metric. I'm not selling ten of those things. It was hard yeah. enough to sell one. End of 2022, all the sales and manufacturing stats for uh, market variances for that year came out and one of the interesting ones was that the best-selling vehicle in the UK so not car vehicle is the Ford Transit so of all the vehicles you can buy the Ford Transit is still that's remarkable the one. It? it is just ahead of the Nissan Qashqai which is that's a big win I, that's a massive win <laughs> can I just say I, I'm probably going to be really talking out of turn here but I've got a real problem with Ford making a big thing about the Transit being the best-selling vehicle because I can't help but feel that it's one of those sort of Clever bits of PR where they're actually covering up the fact that their yeah. cars don't sell. All of, their <laughs> all of their passenger cars, the sales have just <laughs> dropped like a stone. Because they've managed to sell 10,000 transits through Amazon over the mm -hmm. last year, they can actually successfully say that it's the best selling vehicle, mm -hmm. ignoring the fact that the cash guy yeah. is the best selling car, car and the Tesla's done all right and all this sort of thing. The top 10, as you'd see it now, is so devoid of a lot of Ford compared to, say, mm -hmm. 20, 30, yeah. 40 years ago. I think. The Ford PR machine has done what it needs to do, and there's nothing wrong with the Transit, and I think it's great that the Transit has done <laughs> it's well. A great However, I can't even feel that this sort of spin of, oh, we're the, still the best seller, 
is sort of, they've moved the goalposts slightly. Strong. So what you're saying is that the Ford marketing machine is as strong as ever. Well, it is, <laughs> and they've done quite well to sort of herald that. And yeah. they think, well, you're quite right though, because there's they they really are diminishing in the set. I mean, for a start, as you've seen in our Mark One Fiesta road test video, if you have, the Fiesta has been in the top ten best selling cars in the country every single year since it was launched, except last year, mm -hmm. and and it's been knocked yeah. off, and it's not top anymore, I mean, and the the focus is hanging on by a thread the Mondeo is being killed off well of course they're all, they're all being I think, you know, they're all being killed off aren't they Fiesta uh, Focus and Mondeo at some point Fiesta mm. production finishes in May and some of, the, some of the sales were being blighted by availability of microchips and all that, that kind of that stuff that has killed a lot <clears throat> so the sales figures are distorted all over the place but I just I think that whole transit thing is, is a, it's a real kind of red herring story really see, had, I, had I had your cynical mindset when I read that story I would have had to look to see how say Ford Transit sales compared to Ford Escort sales in the 1980s. Yes. Yeah, that would be good. Because if the Ford Transit has always been actually the best-selling Ford product, which yeah, I don't, don't think it ever has been, but inter it'd be interesting to see if that. It's interesting to draw parallels with America on this one, because don't forget, the, the best-selling vehicle in America, not just car, best-selling vehicle, yeah. is the Ford F-150 yeah. pickup truck. Yeah. So are Ford really good at making commercial vehicles? Are they really good at marketing them? Or is it just a, de a desperate plea to make them look... I mean, marketable. There is just a genuine point about commercial vehicles are selling, uh, have continued to sell well in the last couple of years because there's also a big push about home deliveries and that yeah. last mile piece. Well, so there's loads of owner operator drivers that tool around in vans. When we were all at home in lockdown, you were still getting deliveries from Amazon and all your online suppliers and all your yeah. food. And there's a good chance that came in a transit van. Yeah. And to be fair, and you, I don't know if you've ever driven a Mark 7, Mark 8 transit, they drive superbly. They, they drive like a big car. I'm trying to yeah. remember what the most recent transit I've driven, but is not not the most recent one, but definitely some modern ones, and they are they are properly good fun to drive. You sort of yeah. come away you come away from you know, if you rent one to have, move house or something. You come away thinking, why don't I get one of these over here as a, yeah. instead of a car? They're if really I, good. If I could justify, it, I would have one. I mean, they're, they're they're not devoid of problems, and I know people who work with sort of four five year old ones, and they start to have issues. There, there's there's one example I know. Transit tipper failed on the um, it was a gearbox went it was pulled out of action, and there were none in the country. So this fifty thousand pound tipper was out of action for months. Wow. So it's not it's not infallible, but when they are working, they are brilliant. Yeah. Speaking of brilliant, I think we should move on to our mark of choice, gentlemen, for this episode, which we have called "On Your Marks," resurrecting our previous podcast title today. MG, the mighty octagon. The MG, mighty, yes. controversial octagon. Yes. Well, yes. Well, we were talking about Lotus resurgence. Yes. Earlier. Well, MG's obviously had something of a resurgence, resurgence. Hasn't it? and of course, the top question is: Is it MG that is resurging, or is it is there does does the MG of today have any any justifiable connection? With well, the, from what from what, what I've what, read and seen, and actually we've got an MG five on the fleet. One do, of the yes. editors has got an MG. Saw it in the car park. Yep. Um, I think the latest product <laughs> seems pretty decent. The yep. MG four has got good reviews. Very good. Ex excellent you can't, reviews. You yep. can't knock the affordability and crucially the availability of these things. And the range is decent for the money. They are. Yep. Absolutely. Um, but I mean, I, I just think that the MG that we see now is nothing related yes. to oh, the yeah. MG of old. And uh, but that doesn't mean there's nothing wrong with the new Indeed. one. But I can also understand why enthusiasts that might be driving an MGB sort of think this is not the brand course, I've signed. But up. but not universally, because when we've spoken to the MG Car Club and the MG Owners Club, there are plenty of people there who have a midget or a B, but they have a modern ZS or an MG5 because they still want something MG. -y, yeah. mm -hmm. But actually, you wouldn't daily drive an MGB if you want to depend on it. And yeah. and actually, there is there is room for all. Even like the MG Car Club has got a section for the the yeah. current stuff. And yeah. I'm not. I mean, I if I was looking at an EV in reasonable sort of financial levels yeah. an mg4 would be pretty near yeah. the top of my list make a strong case it's sales. a very good car yeah, yeah. yeah so we did have an mg6 on the fleet <laughs> uh, oh sort of very yeah. briefly and it was blighted from the start really i mean it it was a lovely car to drive it drove actually. very well for what it was um, yes, yeah unreliable it had some electrical except when problems. i was driving it it liked me i think i was the only one that i never had any issues with it and then i i drive it all day and it'd be absolutely fine and then the next day someone would take it somewhere and it would just throw up throw up all sorts of warning lights make and random and, noises yeah, and yeah. Ran, make random noises and stuff so but anyway so that was <laughs> but I, I sort of remember thinking well this there's, there's, there's a sort of basis of actually a really good mm -hmm. car here and of course the rover 75 kind of, <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> As we've touched on, very yeah, good car. It, it reminded it reminded me of how people might have judged a, a, a Hyundai, as they're now called, yep. or a Kia, um, you know, 20 years yep. ago. Yeah. 
laughed and mocked at the plastic and the finish, and now look at those guys now. And I think that's MG's on that same path, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yeah. And you can therefore see the sort of the steady improvement in the the cars and the relevance to our market and the quality and the reliability. So not, knock them at your peril, really. Yeah. I think I or think underestimate them. We have to say the MG6 was probably a low point for the mark. But what what is what Ooh, is it? Well, I mean, I think you've, there's lots of people would say that that's not the case maybe, if you maybe not. look at the All whole right. back catalogue. Well, well, let's well let's let's consider that whole back catalogue, yeah. then, gentlemen. Quick fire, best and worst. MG. I think the most fun I've ever had driving MGs is midgets. Agreed. Absolutely agreed. Uh, I had a, I, I, the only MG I've ever owned myself was a midget. It was an MG, it was a bright orange midget 1500, but it was brilliant. I really enjoyed it. I found it perfectly fun. I did long trips in it. I did, had it, I sort of dated it even though I wasn't, it wasn't like I was doing long, long commutes in it, but it was my go-to car for the summer. I tried to take it to Brands Hatch and it broke down. That was the one time it broke down, but I did, oh, yeah. I did take it for a good throughout brown, an evening around Cadwell Park, which is like sort of a tr circuit almost designed for MG Midgets. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it needed some work doing on it here and there, but apart from the one catastrophe on Dart, that it broke down on the crest of the Dartford Bridge, oh. it was absolutely fine. And I really enjoyed it and I have driven better midgets, you know, chrome bumper, 1255cc yep. ones, and they're brilliant. Worst MG. You see, objectively, I think the one I've driven that has been the least enjoyable was the Mark III Magnet Automatic, but that's basically an Austin Cambridge with an MG badge. Yeah, so and, you can't really level, you know. For what it is, it, yeah, that's what it is, but yeah, that is the worst MG I've driven. It was a really nice example, and had it been an Austin Cambridge, it would have been quite charming, but it's, just, it's not a sports saloon. Agreed. And, but again, it looked nice, it had a really nice interior, and it was a very comfortable thing to do, so, but yeah, I think that's I think probably... I agree with you with the midget. The midget would be certainly up there for me, but if we've got to pick something different, yeah. I'll go with the MGF. Mm -hmm. because I just think they're really good. I love the sort of the, the genesis of the car, the, the sort of engineering sort of ingenuity of it all. Obviously developed on a pittance, but actually yep. it was a good car to be. And actually I don't even mind the TF, the coil sprung TF that replaced mm -hmm. it. So I, th I would put that sort of up there as a, as a, yep. as a pucker modern MG. The, I guess if I was to, from a similar era actually as a worst MG, I would go for something like a really last of the line MG ZS, so the Rover 45 yeah. MG version, where, where they've stripped out all the, the kind project of the good drive bits, ones, where yeah. they sort of ripped all the costs out of it, so it's cheap, plasticky, yeah. tacky, and you know, the Rover 45 as a base of the car is actually quite decent, if you get a 2001 version, yeah. a Rover 45, great, good car. but actually the MG ZS version, by the time you get to 2005, Weak. A dreadful car, yeah. and I would, I, I, I would say that. almost in a way made worse by the fact that when it came out in 2001, the original ZS actually surprised lots of people because it was rated really highly for its handling. It's mm. the V6 So you've got that potential and the sort of glimmer of a really good yeah. car, and, the, and as, which is the thing that frustrates and annoys a lot of people about MG, is that they sort of, it's almost like they're sort of eight out of ten all yeah. the way through. How Rover and how MG is yeah. that? Yeah. I mean, in a similar vein, I would say a low point for MG personally, and it's not a low point in its own right. If you went and drive one now, you'd say, this is really good. But looking at it in the context, is the really late... TFs, so oh, cars yeah, like the yeah. LE500, because they're good cars in their own right, but by the time you're up to 2009, 2010, that is a 15 or 20 year old car. Based, based on based on even older bits. Based on a Metro, yeah. and it's being flogged to death, and it's hideously outdated, and it's still the same price or more as a Mark III Mazda MX-5, yeah, which yeah, would nice. walk all over it. Exactly, so it's objectively not a bad car, but revoltingly outdated yeah. by then. And yeah. on the flip side of a good point, I can't say midget, which was my default choice. <laughs> I haven't spent enough time in a B to nominate that. I, say, yeah. I, I, I was oddly, I was charmed by the RV8. Mm. I, I wouldn't say that's the best mm. MG ever, but the fact that they took such an old platform and it's deeply flawed, it's cramped, and it's scuttle shaky, but I like the way it looks and I love the noise and I think yeah. oh, there's, 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 a, there's an underdoggy charm to the RV8 in, the same, in a similar mould, actually, to the, the, the straight six Aston DB7 in that right. objectively not actually particularly good, but you can see a little glimmer of on the right road, you know what? This is all right, yeah. and and I think I feel I feel a bit sorry for the RV8. So I'm gonna I'm gonna. So it's, in, as I said, it's interesting that neither of us said anything about the MGB, the no. definitive classic the, MG, yeah, exactly. the most successful sports car in history until the MX5. The definitive cars. classic, the arguably. Defin in, yeah, in many ways, the definitive classic, particularly in in Britain. Um, I, I think the MGB is a really interesting. I think it's simultaneously one of the most overrated and underrated cars. Yes, I agree. You read some people who I think probably a little bit too deep into the MG world and maybe wear slightly too much Octagon, Octagon branded 
accessory clothing, yes. who will say that the MGV is the best sports car ever and will not hear a word against it. And equally, you see that you get the, oh, it's just an Austin Cambridge without a roof and it's useless. And, and that's it's harsh. Other, and that is over, both inaccurate, it, it's not an Austin Cambridge without a roof, and not fair. But I was quite ambivalent about the MGB when I, you know, in my early years and when I was driving them, I've lost track of how many I've driven in this job now, it, literally dozens. And they were all okay, but yeah, you know, un I never came away particularly whelmed by them. And then I drove a res very nicely restored showroom spec and no further to really high standards, but from tires to roof, from front bumper to back bumper, um, Mark 1 MGB GT, chrome bumper, 1.8, straight out of the, the late 60s. And I drove that for a day around the North Yorkshire Moors and it was fantastic. It wasn't fast. I was out accelerated by a Vauxhall Vectra diesel estate at one point, but it was, it drove dynamically, for, you know, considering what it was, you know, Lotus Land would beat it in every, every respect, respect, but for what it was, good fun. Superb. I, and, I think I would have an MGB GT yeah. actually. And I, I, would, I wouldn't yeah. have the, the Roadster, I'd, I'd, have, I'd have a GT. I think they're still very yeah. pretty cars. We've got an MGB GT on the fleet, of course. Yeah, spoiler, 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 video coming soon. There's no spoiler, spoiler. there's no spoiler on it. But, um, and, uh, <laughs> we haven't given it to Fast Car, have but, we? Uh, but I think um, I'm looking forward to having a go in that when that's finished because mm. I think actually it's not a bad yeah. example. There's been a few issues with it, but um, I'm looking forward to getting yeah, my, my, it's my, my ongoing experience with MGBs is there are a lot of them out there that look a lot prettier than they actually are. Mm. And when you get one that's been properly maintained or properly restored and properly fettled, they're really good. And then you get some that are a bit baggy and you can see where the reputation sort of comes from, that they're a bit of a bit of a wolf, a bit of a sheep yeah. in wolf's clothing. Yeah, I think you just need to see it for what it is, yeah. which is a good that's, fun that's the other thing. I think a lot of people come in with, you come in with slightly high expectations, which doesn't help, but that's all again, partly of MG's fault for marketing them so heavily. I would like to close out the MG thing because we started by talking about modern MG, bring that round. So, in 2022, MG was the eighth best-selling EV brand in wow, the UK. That's strong. 51,050 total sales in 2022, which is a 3.16% market share, up 66.8% on 2021. And so that sale, that 51,000 sales, is more than Citroen, Fiat, Honda, Renault, Land Rover, and Skoda individually, not combined. Obviously, that would be yeah. magnificent. And they're just behind Peugeot. That's incredible. And so that's 51,000 in the UK? Yes. Just as that, so, I mean, Jaguar not. can't have been selling that worldwide. I don't think Jaguar sold 51 cars worldwide last year, did they? Yeah. So and that's... the best year for MGB production was 1972 when they made 39,300. Wow. And they made 77,000 MGFs in total, and the they... whole production run. And so they made 51,000. So they, they've made three quarters of the same total of the MGFs in, in like one, one year. year by selling not particularly MG-ish yeah. EVs. Well, well I, I, was, I, was in, I was in London just before Christmas yeah. and uh, just off Park Lane, there's a car park underground and there's rows of EV charging points and they were all MG5 Uber drivers. Yeah. Just it's, charged up no, I, it's easy to get cynical about them from a, it's not a classic yeah. roadster point of view, but actually I think MG are making good moves and they're, they're, they're a disruptor. The new, the new MG is a disruptor and actually that's what Hyundai and Kia were 10 years mm -hmm. ago and, and I for one welcome them. And yeah. although, although, I, although I don't, I say accept, that's putting it very strongly, but I don't, I don't consider the modern MG to be a true spiritual continuation, you know, corporate or spiritual continuation yeah. of, the, of the classic MG. As a British car enthusiast, both as a car enthusiast in Britain and someone who is enthusiastic about British cars, it does give you a slightly warm, fuzzy feeling when yeah. you see that MG is doing so well. And if you'd gone back to the 1960s and said, oh yeah, you know, in, 50, in 50 years, MG will be yeah. a mass, a, one of the best-selling mass market brands in the country. Yeah, yeah. And Rover will, be, you know, Rover will be gone, Austin will be gone, Morris will be gone, yeah, it <laughs> Triumph will be brink, gone. Yeah. You, you've, got to, you've got to admire them. So I think, yeah, I'm, very, I'm pleased for them. Do you know what I'm not pleased about, gentlemen? Fuel leaks. Let's get on to our hot topic. Do you want to talk about E10 in fuel? Do you know what? Yes, I do. So, E10 fuel, if those of you that are watching abroad and don't know, um, as of when was it? It was about September last year, somewhere around then. Like um, the standard date, that we'll, yeah. our researcher is looking for us. Um, uh, the normal petrol you buy at the pump, not super unleaded or anything like that, changed to E10 petrol, which is um, a higher sulfur content, have I got that right? Higher it's, ethanol. It's just the, ethanol. It's the, it's the ethanol, which is yes. all sorts of all sorts of chemical nasties, and that can do all kinds of things. It can drag nastiness up through your fuel system. It can rot fuel hose out because a lot of hose on older cars, particularly, isn't certified for it. And that all comes to a head when you realise how quickly and easily it can rot through it. Mm -hmm. Last week, you may remember, I was filming with a Daimler Super V8 for an upcoming Jaguar X308 buying guide. It needed fuel. 
we put fuel in it. There was a slightly petroly smell, so we rather assumed we'd spilt some. And um, James from WB was moving the car for us, and there was fuel gushing out from underneath it at a rate of knots, like that someone had turned a tap on. Looked underneath it, and all the fuel hoses were rotten. Oh, on, wow. a, on a relatively modern Daimler Super V8, that's, yeah. that's less than 25 years old, and the E10 has been, and we could look, and indeed, E10 fuel, old hose, rotted through yeah. it. And that's effectively, that's a massive job on a car like that because of the amount of fuel hose and the complications. It's probably dragged all kinds of rubbish through the fuel so system. You can still buy E5, but it's expensive, super unleaded. And you can't always get it. A little remote petrol station might not have super mm. in the middle of the countryside. So I'm not a fan of this. I <laughs> I'm really, really not well, a fan because I wanted to drive a Super V8. <laughs> what, what's, what's the answer? Because, I mean, aren't we just aren't we pushing this because, you know, if the intention is to be E100 eventually because we want 100% biofuel... What's the answer? We just need to upgrade all our fuel lines and, you know... I, I think this is one of those issues that means a lot in the classic car world, but in the broader spectrum is actually not a problem. Yeah, and obviously, that, this is the world we're in and we're talking about. And I've also been affected by it. My, my 2CV sprang a fuel leak precisely because E10 had rotted out. The, was, I had one of the... It was um, one of those old um, one, uh, rubber, rubber hoses with the, wood, the sort of canvas braiding around the outside, yes. and it completely rotted through all of that because the braided hose is completely incompatible with E10 because the problem with E10, if you want to get technical, is that the ethanol in it dries out all the polymers and things in the rubber that keeps it soft and it goes all brittle and then you start getting cracks and it goes porous and the oxygen gets in and then it just sort of splits. It's Science corner here on Classics World. <laughs> but no, um, that, that, exactly, and that's yeah. what causes issues for particularly older cars where the rubber might be starting to deteriorate anyway, like your 2CV. Yeah, and, and, and obviously even vaguely modern, I think a lot of the uh, sort of French and German manufacturers started fitting E10, or I think E10 and above compliant ho rubber hoses in the early 2000s and things. So this really is a old car and an old car that has you know, probably not been in regular use, otherwise the problem would have surfaced much, much uh, sooner issue and that's not to diminish the issue when it happens but it's yeah it's um so isn't i mean i don't want to sound blasé about it but yeah. is it effectively just a case that we've probably all got to do a bit of upgrading with yeah. the cars and make sure that we either you know use e5 fuel anyway when, yeah. or upgrade the fuel lines accordingly exactly or you can get an ethanol uh converter liquid to put yes, in there you, rather like right. rather like you used to get lead replacement stuff to put in your you can get ethanol stabilizers and things although i think again they it can be a false economy. It can be a false economy, good. and obviously some of them, some of them, some of the products you see things where they don't work as claimed. I think that depends on whether brands. brands and you, you know, whether it's being used and dosed in the correct measure and stuff. And ethanol has other problems. The E10 petrol doesn't survive as well in terms of sort of shelf life. And so, is the fuel economy meant to suffer? As well? And it does. It, apparently, it does. Um, the the sort of Surveys and they say that it could be one between one and two percent on MP, you know, reduction on MPG. My two CV, which is uh, obviously an engine designed in the 30s to run on petrol that had bits of twigs floating in it, <laughs> noticeably ran worse on E10. Yeah, a lot of people report. Um, I didn't notice any performance drop, and when you've got two CV, every horsepower counts. Yes, but. Uh, the sort of the pickup. If you suddenly put the power on, it was more stumbly. It didn't seem to idle quite as well. And had I been determined to run it on E10 permanently, I'd have had to sort of adjust the static timing and things. But as it happens, because I the 2CV is very much a hobby car, I just put E5 in it because it's worth the extra. Because because it doesn't cost me much, and it, the tank's so small. They cut the cost to you know not significant enough. And I, that doesn't mean I scorn E10. I have put E10 in it when it's not been available. I just haven't been bothered to hunt out a petrol station with it, uh, which hence why it got the fuel leak. The, the solution is E5 if you can't... Because uh, in the trail up to the phasing in of E10, there was an awful lot of uproar and sort of consternation yeah. from classic car owners. But, I mean, like you say, to some extent, is this a bit of a parochial problem? The wider world probably doesn't care less. Uh, all I will say is this, is if you, if you happen to run a car with Bosch cage on it, which is already a complex <laughs> system, a friend of mine has been rebuilding it on his W123, um, put E5 in it. Yes. Honestly, don't even don't even attempt that, E10 that, in that. That. That, is, that is a good point, though. Yes, obviously, Bosch yeah, early Bosch can be fixed, but it's expensive. So again, the cost benefit thing weighs up. Yeah, and suddenly you start to think, well, is 10p a litre that much more in the grand scheme of things? When the alternative is you've got to send your Cagetronic distributor yeah. off Precisely. for a 500 pound rebuild, Precisely. and suddenly you think, who's actually doing enough miles a year that that fuel difference makes a difference? It, right. it it's not the 
I'm not against putting super in cars. I've put super unleaded in my new car. Mm. Um, but it's it's the it's the fact of one day I'm sure it will happen that I'll be out in the middle of nowhere and I will have to put e e10 in it because there isn't super available and that that is what's worth considering. But pretend, but if you, let's say that that scenario happened and you put ten pounds worth of e10 to mm. to get you home, because it, depending on how quickly you use that fuel, would the actual knock on effects be? Terrible if, or what? If you just, for example, say if I had a tank full of, e, of E5 and it got low and I put a little dribble of E10 in just to get me home and then put a full tank of E5, E5 and run it through and carried on using E5, you're probably all right. It's, if, it's through continual long term. My understanding is that it's cumulative. So that, that little dose of E10 will have an effect, but it's using tankfuls of E10 again yeah. and again and again. So I, yeah. One, you'd probably be all right. Yeah. So yeah. fuel hoses perish with age anyway so this isn't you know this yeah. this is only making more this is only bringing for if your fuel hoses start start gushing petrol because they perish from e10 that's only in effect only bringing forward a job that you would have had to yeah. do at some point it anyway. still would have needed doing it yeah. and it's also probably too early to tell whether the rollout of e10 has shortened the life of rare models like you say yeah. or you know it's probably it's probably hard to know because Rarer cars probably aren't used that much yes. anyway. They're yeah. probably in the hands of responsible owners who probably have done the right. And they've put E5 in it or whatever. So it, it, know, it's a long-term thing, but user beware is all we'd say. This is the one of the few cases in the modern world where as a owner of a 25-year-old diesel car, I can be very smug. Yes. That's one way, one way to avoid the ethanol problem, <laughs> is to get a diesel. Buy a diesel. Buy yeah. a diesel, but of course that comes with all the other problems because they're being yeah. gradually... You're not allowed in any no, city. You can't, go in, you can't go any, yeah. near any built-up areas yeah. um, and you'll be hounded out as a pariah for pumping all sorts of particulates in the atmosphere, but you don't have to worry about your fuel system gushing. Yes. And if you get a suitable, like an old Mercedes diesel or my old Peugeot diesel, you can run it on pure, 100% biofuel, no modification. And this is where I start going on about our yellow 205 that we had and how yes. much I miss it. One but more. I'm not going to buy it back, though, because it's in Ireland these days. But what if you do want to buy something new, lads? Let's turn our eyes to the classifieds. <laughs> Lovely segue. Pro at this. Beautiful. 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 Yeah. You'd never know I used to work in radio, would you? Exactly. <laughs> so we've been looking on uh, Car and Classic. We've looked in our own classifieds in Classic Car Buyer and the auction houses we've been visiting this month, WB and Sons. What have we found, gents? Phil? Uh, right, so looking into Classic Car Buyer, uh, I've got a few that I've, um, I've earmarked here. Uh, I'm going to do a proper sort of Sunday morning politics show, but I put my reading glasses on. Uh, so the first one was a Ford Focus ST, real kind of modern classic. 170, very nice. Uh, and I, I just, I really, I, re I like the Gen 1 Ford Focus anyway. I think it's just a, a genius piece of design, real sort of Ford at its peak. Uh, this is a 2003 model, 126,000 miles, only a thousand pounds. Um, it, it, says it, it says here it needs some mechanical work and two new tyres, but to be honest, really well supported engine, you know, loads you can do with it. In the current market, £1,000, I think, is a, yep. to get any car for £1,000 mm -hmm. at the moment uh, is actually an achievement, let alone something so. interesting. Um, a Jaguar S-Type R, I owned an S-Type R in this very colour. Uh, this one's a 2006 model with 77,500 miles on it, £8,500. Uh, I'd have one of those in a heartbeat. Agreed. The um, the looks will be divided, but the <laughs> engine is just just superb. It really is. You've even had a message from someone saying how exactly. good it looks. Yeah, good, good uh, yeah, good, absolutely. On a more traditional front, Triumph Vitesse. You yeah. like these, don't you? Nice, nice package. I, I really yeah. like the uh, Triumph Vitesse. Uh, this one's a rare one because it says here 1995. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a slight typo. Anyway, uh, but it's um, uh, it's a lovely. I, I love I love the Herald and the Vitesse. But uh, yes, if I could have a Vitesse and just maybe just gently modernise it for modern traffic mm -hmm. usage. New brakes and things. Yeah, yeah I, would, I would have one of those. Uh, and it's up for £6,600, which is That's probably sort of, you know, re reasonably peaky, but I think well, well worth it. I think the Vitesse is such good value. I mean, all those, I mean, apart from the Spitfire, which I'm not saying is overvalued, but I think it's more close to what you sort of, you know, they're higher price. Herald and the Vitesse, I think, are really good value still. They want to agree. So I've also been sticking to the uh, CCB classifieds, um, and I went through as they are in alphabetical order. So the first one that caught my eye was an Austin Metro GTA. Ooh. So that's a, a nice an A series powered Metro. This the GTA is basically the MG after they stopped calling the MG. So it's an Austin with a body kit and a rear spoiler and go faster stripes and very 80s italicized. GTA badges on Sporty. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so, and I like a Metro. I had one in four, before it met a sad end at the Hand of Thieves, and I still occasionally miss it. Um, I think the Metro has, I think, kind of 
been properly redeemed in the recent years. Mm. I think they've gone. When I had mine, it was a laughing stock. <laughs> now, yeah. now it's not a laughing yeah. stock. You made them cool, Jack. I single-handedly made them. <laughs> sure and this GTA is very cool. How much is it? Yeah, that the, that one. The price has actually changed this year. The, when I saw it, it was on six thousand nine hundred ninety quid. They are so rare. They, people have realised they're rare. And they're actually very good. They're not as bad as everyone thought they yeah, were. They're, yeah, they're, 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 there's lots to like about them. And the GT, the, the sporty ones, the MGs and the GTAs and stuff are um, very good. Uh, seen, I think, seen for the slice of 80s cool that they yeah, deserve yeah, to be. Absolutely. And then moving down, um, the bear. again, not a car that's particularly dramatic in itself, but I like them. I know Joe likes them. Uh, Rover P4 110. Ooh, Rover P4 with the big, 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 big straight six. Um, for 2,500 quid. That's, that's a, a bargain. Again, P4s are really undervalued, I think, for what they are. I think that's worth it. I think for two and a half grand, a Rover P4 110 in, semi, you know, in decent nick, why, why wouldn't you? Can I mention some exotica? Can go I go on. to the other end of the food yeah. chain? Because we paid a visit to our friends at WB and Sons. They've always got interesting stuff in. Loads yes. of minis from Jeff and uh, yeah. W123 <laughs> and so on. Um, they've also got their headline car, a Ferrari 400, which wouldn't necessarily be my bag, but it did used to belong to ex-Rolling Stones member Bill Wyman, in fact. And this was um, specifically ordered each member of the Rolling Stones to have one order from by their producer. Bill's one is silver with a blue leather interior. You've seen it as well, and it's lovely. Guaranteed maximum satisfaction. Well, Wild yeah. horses wouldn't pull you away from buying it. There's I've no done all these gags yes. in the auction reel, but anyway. There's no Rolling Stone chips on it, yes, anymore. Exactly. Um, and the estimate on it is incredibly reasonable. It's estimated on uh, 18 to 22,000 pounds, which is cheap for any Ferrari 400, let alone one yeah. with that kind of provenance. Exactly. Even if it goes for double its estimate, that is still a cheap Ferrari, and more importantly, the provenance. The 400i is not the sort of poster child that I remember <laughs> of the 80s, no. but it's still a fabulous car. It looks great. I was, yeah, I was, yeah. When I saw it up close, I was like, that's actually quite a good looking car in its way. Yeah. It's sort of like a sleeker Volvo 700. Yeah. I think that's exactly how Ferrari described it at the time. There you go. <laughs> Ferrari, 800, Ferrari 400 is like a sleeker Volvo 700. And that seems like a perfect way to draw to a close our first ever podcast, gentlemen. Yes. I think we've, we've covered a lot of topics, a lot of controversy, a lot of... Stuff, stuff you mean to go on. Hopefully some inspiration for the comments. Do drop us a line with any of the thoughts that uh, you've had on what we've talked about. Any opinions, any, uh, any MGs, any E10 petrol stories, anything like that, do drop it below. So these are going to be monthly as far as we're aware. That's our aim. They will be on the YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash classicsworlduk, and they will be on your podcast provider of choice, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, etc. Keep it classic. Uh, thanks for watching. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. See you again soon. This video is proudly sponsored by Lancaster Insurance. Give them a call on 01480 400 889 for an insurance quote on your classic car. And don't forget to click the link below to enter their latest competition.